that, we decided that a good name for the business was Speech Perfect. Because of the, the sales component of it as well, and I help people pitch, but getting that the Speech Perfect as to what you're going to say and how you're going to say it and how you're going to deliver it, whether it is in a stand up and deliver a pitch or you're standing on a stage in front of a thousand people and you have got a presentation and all of those things that components of it the structure the delivery the whole part of it and that's something that i have been doing for a couple of decades and spend a lot of time mentoring people to gain that confidence and ability to do that when we first got into business and i i largely think this is why businesses and we're going to use the air quotes here and call them businesses fail it's not that businesses really fail it's just that we get burned out and go oh my god i've got to learn so many things i've got to learn it skills i've got to learn sales skills and marketing skills and i've got to be able to deliver and i've got to be more organized than i was before and i think the, the main difference is that Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of More Clients, Less Effort. I am joined today by the amazing Janine Vosper. Janine, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Tim. I'm looking forward to it. Now, we're going to learn lots more about speaking shortly, but for over 20 years, Janine has worked as a general manager of sales for a successful multi-million dollar business, coaching high-performance commission-based sales teams for which speaking and using their voice is an incredibly powerful tool. So, Janine, I'm curious, how did you get into, well, sales speaking? Take me back. Oh, there's a long way to go back, Tim. The, the sales component of it, I have just always been doing something that was around the sales. I taught aerobics for 10 years, and I think that was one of the most interesting sales conversations that you have. It's not selling membership into gyms. It's getting people to put their shoes on and turn up at the class. It's yeah. something that you've got to offer them that they, motivates them to do that. And from there, I studied management, moved into a repping role for a, the largest privately owned first aid supply company in Australia, and then moved into the GM role in, in that space. What it was is my, I was originally on commission only, which is really what everyone who's in their own business is on commission only. Yeah, we don't really think about like that, do we? That's re you really make a really interesting point. We, if we don't do the work, we don't get paid. So there's not too much difference from from a commission based sales rep role to a commission based business role, right? No, you got the same amount of skin in the game, even more so when it's your yeah. own business. So when I was repping, I was given a territory. It was really interesting when I was going through the stock that I I had from the previous person. I found all these racing slips in the in the goods that they the territory took in the two racetracks in Brisbane, and I'm sure that's what they used to spend part of their day was on the racetrack. So I took that really from zero to over four hundred thousand dollars a year in sales, and we're talking about bandages and band aids and all of that first aid supply range. Yeah. Then as I moved into that GM role, the I took the company. This is through GFC. Yeah. Three million to over ten million dollars a year in sales with the same techniques that I'd been using, and and then helping my sales team again on commission to achieve those same results. So and we kept and we had people on commission and they stayed there for for some of them had been there ten years prior to me arriving and was still working there. So very long term employee well they weren't employees contractors considering mm. they were on commissions. It's, they had they had great rewards, which meant that they stayed. Yeah, I'm curious. Like with commissions, obviously, it's one of the things that as we get started in business, we 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 often go, okay, do I take on the overhead of a salary, or do I find someone who's willing to do a commission based role? What's the difference in consideration from your perspective about what you offer and what sort what sort of person that attracts? What it has legalities around it, and each state has different requirements our team we couldn't have set, set targets we couldn't have set kpis are meant to be contractors or you could we could offer incentives and it was usually the financial or for me when i first started the incentives for me were overseas travel when they're achieved each year and and 
travel somewhere. My husband and I would travel somewhere on the on the business. And so but that's the competitiveness. I think that's part of what is necessary when you're in sales is it wasn't competing to get sales. It was competing to get the more clients you could help to get the results that they wanted. So but and that's still that mindset now in my own business. And I started Speech Perfect in 2007 and I was still working as a GM and it was just really background learning the things that I needed to learn that were different from running a business to being in your own business and setting things up. And this is something I really encourage people to do if they're thinking about moving into their own business because it takes about three years to get good results and there's very few overnight successes that, and most people who move into their own business, that type of thing, it's usually more a service base. I'm good at this. I'll be a consultant. You re- you do need to set up yourself financially, get all of the training that you need beforehand, get your website done, get the things done that, that your job can be your investment into your new business. And then moved into Speech Perfect, which I went full time into that 2018. Yeah. Why did you, you've got a successful role. I mean, clearly you've You've had success as a sales rep. You've moved into this GM role and running that. Why start Speech Perfect at all? My One of my highest values is freedom. To be, and I had a lot of freedom in the repping role and in the GM role as to the things that I could I could do. And be, it was because it's not government, I didn't have really an, any answerables that I could just make decisions, which is a very cool place to be in. But I personally wanted more freedom. And I'm very much into what do I want for the next 10 years of my life? It's not just setting a goal for that 10 years. It's really what lifestyle do I want? And I could see, well, this was 20 years ahead. What do I want to be doing when I reach the mature age that I am now? And how do I want my life to look? And I did not want to be dreading Monday mornings. Yeah. And I love Mondays now. It's my favorite day of the week because it's not a day where you think I've got to go to a J-O-B. Yeah. I, I, what I do is all for me, all for my clients. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the key thing, right? When you're working for someone else, you're always working towards someone else's goals. And when it's when it's your business, you get to do the thing. And it's interesting you, you, you talk about the sort of the overnight success stuff. I spent the week weekend reading Atomic Habits, oh, good. Which I, James Clear, for the first time. And I'm now kicking myself to think, why didn't I read this book sooner? Right. <laughs> I'd skimmed it. I kind of got the idea of like your, your habits are that sort of culmination of, of, of all these all your goals are the culmination of all the habits that sort of mm-hmm. make up the thing. So I think, I think the thing that, that I you talk about that overnight success there. Yeah. Like all the stuff that you do to get to a point where someone suddenly recognizes and go, well, I've never heard of you before. You must be an overnight success. They go, no, I am put an absolute shit ton of work into getting to this point. But I appreciate that. Thank you. Definitely. If you get an opportunity to read Stephen Bradbury's biography, autobiography, yeah. then definitely do that. For those that don't know who he is, he's the luckiest ice skater in the world. And that's what you know, everyone else in the finals fell over and he was the only one that was able to finish the race. But you realize what went into that to be in that final, in that position, to be able to finish the race when no one else could. It, it was years of injury and, and work, hard work and, and mental fortitude to get him through and, and mental spaces where he really struggled getting through. But there he is, gold medalist at Winter Olympics. And, and the people now say, do a break. What was the biggest difference for you? What did you notice moving from comfortable employment, regular paycheck, you know, every second Thursday? The regular paycheck. Week, regular <laughs> paycheck. What was, the, what, was the, what was the biggest thing that you noticed in the difference between now running Speak to Influence compared to compared to the, your GM role? I mean, effectively, you're still doing the same thing, right? You're just GM of your own business, not someone else's. But what was the biggest difference? But you have, there's a couple of things. One, the paycheck, definitely. Yeah. The the second thing is that I have to do it all. The, I, I don't have to, and I have VAs and I have bookkeeper, people like that, but I had office staff to do all of those things that I just are not in my wheelhouse to even be bothered with. So I had to learn how to do those things well. And, and what I did, and I really encourage everyone to do that, if you're not sure about stuff, then invest in learning with people who can do it. And then... That way, 
the skills I have now, and my IT is still basic compared to most, but I can get in the back end of my website. I can I can add all the things that I need to do and correct it and improve the SEO and do basic things like that. I would never, I mean, I was lucky to turn on a computer that long ago. It, and so yes. it's, you've got to, you've got to do things yourself. And I think it's one, and it's also one thing getting other people to do it, but knowing that you can do it yourself, I think is so important because that way, if, especially if you say, oh, I hate sales and I don't want to be in sales, I'll hire a salesperson, then you don't know that they're doing a good job. How do they're doing a good job unless you're skilled in that yourself or, or have yeah. training it yourself? It, it's, it, I think that's important anyway, is to have a, a reasonable skill base across and then so that you can ensure people are doing their job. But that's the hardest part, I think, is gaining those skills. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. When we, we sort of look at when we first go into business and I, I largely think this is why businesses, and we're going to use the little air quotes here and call them businesses fail. It's not that businesses really fail. It's just that we get burned out and go, oh my God, I've got to learn so many things. I've got to learn IT skills, as you mentioned. I've got to learn sales skills and marketing skills and I've got to be able to deliver and I've got to be more organized than I was before. And if I'm hiring people, I need HR and I need a bit of IT in there as well, right? And a reasonable understanding of the legal framework in which I work, and then some bookkeeping and finance skills as well to ensure that we get paid on time and regularly. Maybe I need to learn some confrontation skills. Sometimes <laughs> I need to, we were talking just off air of how to debt collection, we right, which, is, which is really confronting. But you're absolutely right. I think the, the main difference is that we have so many different skills that we need to learn to run a business. And you either need to have be an expert in them. Or you need to have just a reasonable idea of what you expect from this thing to be able to hire and have a mature conversation with the person who's doing it. And that's a, such an important factor. And then put some systems in place too, which not a lot of people do and realize the, the importance of that in, in a mm. business. And I had that challenge a few years ago, two challenges. One was to get a VA to do it. But what I did, first of all, was put systems in place regarding the marketing and the things that I wanted the VA to do yeah. and set up, a, and she does more basic, repeatable actions. And that's what I was challenged. Anything I did once then to record how it's done so that there's a system in place and someone else can follow that system and easily yeah. achieve it. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons I sort of pulled out James Clear as in, and Atomic Habits is in, in the thing here is, and I, I I quite like this at the start of the book, he talks about this idea of changing, not just setting a goal. And so many of us just set goals to go, this year I'm going to make a million dollars. But if you don't change your systems, your systems are the thing that deliver the outcome, right? deliver the goal, not just going, didn't make it this year, let's do it again next year kind of thing. All right. But you, you're absolutely right, right? If we got the systems in place, right, not just for staff, for speaking, whatever, around how we do the thing we do it, that means the goal or the outcome becomes more predictable. Yes, yes. And anything that's repeatable, then that you find you're doing yourself over, then that's definitely something that you need to create a systems for. Where they, and, and my suggestion is record it as a video and also record it as a, a written instructions. Yeah. Tell me more about Speak to Influence. What's, what, is, what, is, what is that? Well, the business is speech perfect, and I have to tell you that we, I was at a wedding many years ago, and I was sitting at one of the back tables, and the, the speakers were holding the microphones at their belly buttons, and which meant that none of us could hear it, because I don't know where they thought the voice was coming from. And after a couple of glasses of wine, they were at the table, the movie Pitch Perfect was out at the time, and uh, yes. with all of that, we decided that a good name for the business was Speech Perfect. Because of the, the sales component of it as well, and I help people pitch, but getting that the Speech Perfect as to what you're going to say and how you're going to say it and how you're going to deliver it, whether it is in a stand-up and deliver a pitch or you're standing on a stage in front of a thousand people and you have got a presentation. And all of those things, that components of it, yeah. the structure, the delivery, the whole part of it. And that's something that I, again, have been doing for a couple of decades and spend a lot of time mentoring people to gain that confidence and ability to, to do that. And I think 
I, I just had a conversation just before we come on air with somebody who was wants some one-on-one -on -one coaching, and they were talking about how the brain and the mouth weren't working together very well, how they were wanting to deliver more information but and sort of walking away going, oh, I wish I had said that, I wish I had said that, and learning techniques, and that's what we'll be working with him on, learning mm -hmm. techniques to achieve that. Is there, a, is there a system that someone can put in place to do that sort of thing? Or There's components of a yeah. process to do it yeah. rather than a, a system to do it. Look, the first part is to be really consciously aware that you're speaking words. And I know okay. that. I'm going to go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into that because it's like, <laughs> what do you mean? How are someone not consciously aware that they're speaking words? Have you ever... Oh. And I'm sure the listeners, they've gone, I, I've got 60 seconds to deliver a pitch. I've stood up to deliver a pitch, sat down and go, I have no idea what I said. They weren't consciously aware of what they were saying. This mm. words were falling out of their mouth. And I'll, if this, particularly if they've got 60 seconds to deliver a pitch, they've probably sat there for the last 10 minutes when everyone else is doing it. What am I going to say? What am I going to say? How am I going to say that? Am I going to say that? I don't know what I'm going to say. And then words spill out yeah. as opposed to consciously being aware that of the words as you're saying it, and you sort of a third party observer now. These are the words I want to say. And then you can think about how you want to deliver them, how you, what tone you might want to use as you deliver them, whether you want to pause or not to create that impact with what you're saying. And I just did a little example of speeding things up. Do you want to do that? But you have to be conscious of it rather than just saying things. Yeah, I think you're, you're so right. I, I know I've reflected on this recently and I was just having a conversation about a networking event right? and everyone gets up and delivers their 60 second elevator pitch. Right? But you have no idea what the person before you were saying because you're, if you're the next speaker because you're so focused on like, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Well, what was that? <laughs> right? and, and I think even in, in, in group contexts, any, any kind of sales relationship or pitch relationship where we're, where we're speaking if we get too focused on what I'm about to say, we kind of lose the context of what's being said that Correct. we're responding to. Correct. If I, if I get the opportunity and I'm in a big room where everyone's doing that, I will sit somewhere where I'm last because everyone's like, done that now. They can start paying attention. It always be the first or last speaker, right? Yes. Well, the first, no, they're going to be, everyone in the room is going to miss you. Yeah. Okay. Definitely last. Okay. There we go. Learn something Definitely new. Last. All right. Now I know you've got another system you use. So I want to sort of drill into this really quick. You use Aweber to deliver email sequences. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about why you're using that and how you use it. Okay. Part of the training that I talked about, why I invested heavily in get in upskilling and being able to automate some processes. And the coach that I was using at the time, they used Aweber. I had looked at a couple of different ones. They gave me a couple of options and I decided that this is the simplest. When it comes to anything IT, I want simple and I tend to stick with things because I know how to use it. There's possibly other platforms out there that would be doing the same thing. But for me, it's not laziness. It's just, this makes it really simple for me. With a web art, I can set up different groups that I want messages sent to. I can schedule messages. And because I love to travel and wanted to be very organized this year, for all of the workshops and events that I've got coming up for the year, I had already scheduled all the messaging that needs to go out two days, four days, two weeks before, mm. that it's all scheduled already for the year. Where does that make you feel knowing that that's kind of already in place and already just going to go to like clockwork and just happen. It is just such a relief that I don't have to be constantly thinking about it. Yeah. Saying that, I I do a weekly blog and that is done each week. I'm going away for a four weeks holiday coming up. I may write some and schedule them over that period of time. But I, I like with the blogs to be, hey, this week I was at a chamber meeting and what I saw people doing this like really made me think about is that the best way to do it i just and i have a formula then and i then i get content a quote in the middle and have content so every one of those blogs looks the same but it starts off with this musings about i wonder how you could do something so that's the only one that i do as as required yeah but the rest are all scheduled and it just feels great i just know i can walk out of the room and i have people go and it's the same with scheduling right across social media. It, people go, I thought you were away. Oh, yeah, I am. Anyway, yeah. I am. I am. 
the, I highly recommend, and, and AWeber, as I said, is just one of the, the methods you can do that. But the amount of time and effort and thought it saves me, it's really worth the investment. I don't see it as a cost. I, I have a thing between different, so, different software that we use. Some software is investment and other software we fund, meaning we don't really need it, but we well, continue to have it. So we're just funding it. It's, it's, a, yeah. different, it's a different space. Well, I think, yeah, I think it's uh, like owning a car. If you bought a car for 20, 30, 40, 50, $100,000 right, <laughs> and left it in the driveway and didn't use it, it would be just something that you're funding. Correct. But we yeah. you go for a drive, you know, take your pitch. <laughs> Definitely. What I love about this as well, I, I, it's, it's easy to copy across all the different groups. So I don't have to redo the, the email in the different groups. I just copy it into a certain group and then I can set it and put it on a different date. It all works. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Definitely something I think every business should look at. Again, just for that peace of mind, you just know it's going to happen, right? It's, it's out of the way. It's not stressful. Something I've been trying was trying to tell my son for years before he graduated college last year. But I said, if you just wait, if you leave everything to the last minute, you're going to be stressed, right? You know, if you don't study until the night before the exam, take it from me, from experience, right? you will you'll be rushing to try and get it done, and you probably won't do as good a job as yeah. if you'd planned it in advance, right? But just going, I know that these things are going to happen throughout the year, and if the sooner you start on them, the sooner they become easier to do. And they just sort of become then set and forget. So you can plan 12 months of content, plan out your, what you're doing, go and write those, put them into some form of scheduled release, whether it be for social media, whether it be drip feed for your email or anything like that. And as long as you're writing them in a way that they're almost evergreen. I saw this today. I was I'm just musing, right? And it's not related to, oh my God, did you see last night's storm? As long as it's in that context, or I was watching this thing on TV, right? And yeah. it's, it becomes universal, becomes what we call evergreen and you can use it at any time and you do get that sort of sense of things are in control and they will just happen from from here yes and look you probably guess from that i like things in control tim i'm, I'm always high energy I'm, I'm i don't get tired or i can just keep going and it's not forced it just is it just is me mm. and and but what it means then is if i've already got things done someone says can you write a report on this and i go sure Oh, that that's only a 10 minute thing. I'll do that right now and get that off and it's done. And I do like to get short tasks out of the way very quickly. Yeah. They, it, yeah. they may add up to a period of time, but once they're done, they're done and you don't have to think about them. So it's clearing the, the thinking out of your head is, is such an important factor when it comes to doing those, those tasks. What I find though, is because I've already done the things when someone says, Hey, what are you doing? Do you want to come out for a cup of coffee or go, okay, sure. I'm free in an hour and I can absolutely do that. Yeah. It's not then I go out to coffee and while I'm having with my friend, then I'm sitting there going, I should be, I should be, I should be, I should be. I've got to get that. I've got to get, I've got to get that email out, right? Yeah. I'm curious because your business is very much around speaking and, and helping people kind of, I guess, articulate themselves more effectively through speeches and presentations. Do you find that you're using video content and, and voice content in your written content as well to help you open doors? I do a bit, but it's interesting. It's not in my marketing because I have a lot of video content on my YouTube channel with my own podcast and different conversations I have with people and training. There's a few hundred videos on the YouTube channel that are mostly training things. Some of them are one minute and some of them one hour you're after so yes there's a lot of but it's all content the video marketing that you're talking about that is a something that's in the after i come back from holidays it's something that's in the in the pipeline for the rest of the year to do it that way it makes sense yeah. to do that interestingly though when i create informal video i tend to do this when i without makeup when i'm out walking and they're usually about a minute long and it might be again, you know, this morning I did, and I, I do try and do one each day. And this morning I was talking about where I normally walk because of the weekend here, it rained again. I can't stay on those tracks. Sometimes the, I have to find an alternative route. And, yeah. and then I talked about sometimes in business, we keep pushing through things. And whereas it might be just time to find an alternative route, even if it's just for that day, 
or it might be where you need to go. So I do a lot of those type of things, but they're very much in the space of the out walking again. You know, yeah. A different yeah. Look, I, I really like that. I mean, beautiful metaphor just there. Right? And you're not always going to get it right, but I guess using that voice and video as not just as well as written content allows you to connect to that bigger audience mm-hmm. twice in a more authentic way, right? They can see and hear and get you and, and get to know you a little bit better. I'm going to pivot here and we're going to jump into our quick fire to wrap up the show today. So, But I'm curious to know, have you thought about giving up? Interestingly, when I came back from a long trip last year, again, this is the work life I've created, I got back and went, oh, you know what? I, I could act, I could give up. It, it's not a financial issue as to whether I could or not. And it was, I'm mean, going to just keep traveling. And I had a client booked on that the first day back. And I worked with that client and went, there's no way in the world I could give up. No way in the world at all. It's something that I need to be doing to my mission in life is to enable people to do what they don't believe is possible. So if that's my mission, I've got to be doing it. So no, not really. I can't, I can't imagine giving up ever, really. Yeah. If you were to have coffee with any historical figure, who would it be? first person that popped into my head then was Nelson Mandela, which is really interesting. And him and I have the same numerology, the same numbers. So whether that was relevant to that, I'm not sure. I He used a training program called Spinal, Spiral Dynamics to help him make South Africa a lot more cohesive with all the different groups. And it's something that I find fascinating and I use as well. So whether that's why I thought of that, I think that would be a really interesting conversation. It would be. It would be indeed. What's your biggest failure and what did you learn from that experience? Biggest failure, spending a lot of money investing in things that weren't beneficial. There's things that are not in my, then haven't been following my mission or vision, that they were out of that going, let's go and do something different. And and that really was, I'm not interested in this. So spending thousands of dollars doing some things, they go, it was a more investment sort of direction. This is just not something I'm interested in then not doing anything with it, really. Yeah, no, I get that. I think we've everyone's done that. Let's go with what do people struggle with when it comes to presenting and speaking? One of the things that I found when I first started speaking was that everyone was staring at me, and that was really disconcerting. The perception that some, everyone's staring at you. Everyone's staring at me. No, they weren't. They were staring at me. And then after a while, I went, that's a really good thing because they're not distracted. They're paying attention to you. But it was the first few times it was it was very disconcerting. Yeah. Yeah, it's... yeah, I'm trying to go back to the first time I presented on stage and I think it was at uni, mostly because everyone else was in IT and was not very good at articulating. <laughs> they prefer to be behind the monitor doing code. And yeah. I had to present, uh, I had to present the project that we'd been working on and, and talk through that. And there must've been 200 people in the room, I, I guess. And it was quite a, quite a nerve-wracking sort of thing to think, oh, my God, every, everyone's paying attention to me. But that's the whole point. It is definitely the whole point. <laughs> but actually what you want. It is a good thing. Mine was, my first one wasn't quite as big as that, and this is over four decades ago. And it, I was, as a part-time job, after-hours job, a, a full-time job, I sold Tupperware, and I presented a Tupperware party. And, it, and it, these were friends of these parties as well. I was going, this is freaking me out. I, yeah, it was not big groups, but it was bizarre. Now, it's put me in front of a thousand people and I am in my happy place. Yeah. yeah. yeah get a lot of energy from that, don't you? If you, oh, definitely. If you, learn, to, if you learn to embrace it. Yeah. Janine, lastly, where can we find you online? You can find me online everywhere, janinebosper.com. And for those that are watching this, rather than listening to it, you can see my logo at the back, which is J A N E N V O S P E R dot com. You can find me on LinkedIn, reach out and say hi and follow. That would be wonderful. I'm across all of the socials and I'd love for you know, if you to follow me and also jump on my YouTube channel, which is my name, and follow there and you'll find and subscribe because you, you'll you'll be blown away with the amount of training material that comes out for free. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's the thing, right? The the opportunity is there. It's up to us to decide whether we want to take it or not. Janine, really appreciate you joining us on the show today and sharing your your journey and, and your insights and wisdom into how you're winning more clients with less effort. 
Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Hey, guys. Thanks again for joining us on today's show. Look forward to seeing you next time. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this episode with someone you feel might get value from it. And we'll catch you real soon. <laughs>